but if you're not with the right team, with the right people at the right time, it's not, it's not going to work. Our guest today is Ty Majeski. He's a race car driver. He's also probably the best iRacer of all time with two iRacing accounts over 10,000 I rating. In real life, he currently competes in the NASCAR Camping World Truck Series for Thor Sport. He made it to the Final Four last year, almost winning the championship. The rest of his racing resume is, is just insane. He's won the Snowball Derby. He's won the Slinger Nationals multiple times. He's set the record for the most championships of any ARCA Midwest Tour guy, winning five. He won the scholarship for uh, the Alan Kowicki Driver Development Scholarship, and uh, he was a Roush Development Driver part of that program. So if you guys enjoy this podcast, uh, if you know anyone who's going to like it, share it with some friends, give it a rating. It always helps. Enjoy. So yeah, last year you were working full-time, and now you're, you're still working full-time for Thor Sport, who's the, the team you run for. And w before we started recording, I was asking you, do you do you work on everyone's truck or just your own truck now that you're racing full time for the team? Yeah. So last year I was uh, an engineer and I had to scan all the parts. My my job was to take individual parts. So each upper control arm, spindle, rear end housing, chassis, um, and it all needed to get scanned and put into the um, whichever manufacturer with last year was Toyota. Now it's Ford into the directory and I bit we basically can build um, models of the truck with each individual component per the race team so uh, my job was to scan everybody's parts not just my own um, this year I've taken on a little bit more of a just a, a driving role and uh, mm -hmm. I'll be you know specific to the 98 team and working with Joe and my engineer on, on building fast race trucks and making making fast setups right on how uh, you ran decent at Daytona? How did that go? That was last weekend. Yeah, Daytona was okay. Uh, we had a fast truck. Um, that truck was going for uh, three poles in a row. One with Johnny Sauter last year with myself, and this would have been three in a row. We missed it by just a little bit. Ended up second. Um, the KBM trucks are uh, have a really strong super speedway program right now, so uh, qualified second and and had a really solid points day. Um, you know, we kind of in the past have taken the strategy to uh, run around in the back a little bit and stay out of trouble and maybe give up the stage points in order to get a good finish, but um, it never ends up going that way. So we decided just to race up front all, all night and uh, it worked out. We ended up, I think, sixth in each stage and, and ended up finishing sixth in the race. Um, third in points coming out of Daytona, going into Vegas. So um, can't complain about that. Right. Yeah, I always wonder that and I, like I've never had the opportunity to run a super speedway yet. I'm planning on doing it at some point, but you know, it's so conservative, but there's there's so many, you know, random variables. Like how like can you really just run around at the back or why not just go for it the whole time? I I don't know. It's always a you know, tough to think about. I I've seen it work both ways. We've seen a lot of trucks or drivers or teams win at Daytona or Talladega that maybe wouldn't ordinarily win and they've done it by just being there at the end right so I think you can you can do it either way but I think if you can stay up front and you're smart about it and you can stay inside the top five generally speaking the most of the wrecks happen behind that so if you have a fast enough truck to maintain your track position I think you know with, with the with the fact that stage points are so important throughout the season, um, I think it's worth the risk to um, try and race up front, get collect stage points. And if you collect good stage points and you get in a wreck going for the win at the end, you've already salvaged your day because of those stage points. So um, I think we're just going to go, you know, the reason I'll back up a little bit. The reason why we went with the strategy we did is I, as to your point, I don't have much experience on the super speedways at all. So Talladega is a playoff race for us. So we, I wanted to go into D Daytona with the mentality of, okay, I need to make these moves, even if they're bad moves. And, you know, we end up, you know, getting, you know, getting freight trained while making an aggressive move that didn't work. 
I've got to learn what a good move is, when to make those certain moves because we need to be on our game uh, when we get to the uh, second round of the playoffs in Talladega because that can control our destiny whether we get to race for a championship or not in Vegas. Yeah, it makes sense. Makes sense. I mean, so much to learn over, you know, racing a whole season, racing those super speedways and so many different tracks. Um, but man, let's uh, let's introduce you to or introduce the uh, what you to the world, the world to you, the world to you uh, a little bit, um, kind of build up your backstory here. Where were you born? Where'd you grow up? Yeah, I was born in um, like, uh, I grew up in Seymour, Wisconsin. That's my hometown. Um, so I'm a cheesehead Packer fan, um, and grew up racing there, racing go-karts in Wisconsin, dirt oval go-karts, um, then moved up into asphalt late model racing in the Midwest and, uh, started traveling around the country once we started winning races regionally. And, uh, that's kind of where I was able to really build my roots in racing and, and win a bunch of races and, um, and, and sort of open my own opportunity to the next level uh backing up how did you get into motorsports you know it's always a, everyone has their kind of unique story as to how they were first exposed and what you know why you ended up racing go-karts as opposed to whatever quarter mid midgets or snowmobiles <laughs> yeah snowmobiles would have been you know an obvious choice for us being in wisconsin but um no it's kind of a funny story so I was about eight or nine years old at the time. I'll never forget it. I was sitting at a dinner table and with my family. So my sister, and my, my, my parents, and I was at that age where all my friends were starting to go out for tackle football. And mm. I wanted to, of course, join them. Um, and I wasn't, I'm not a big guy now. I'm about five, 440 pounds now. So you can imagine how small I was then. So my parents didn't want to go, and had me getting hurt, right, playing taco football. I was just a small guy. And we are always, you know, my dad was always a NASCAR fan growing up. We always watched NASCAR races. So, you know, we were, you know, NASCAR fans. And my dad's like, man, you know, what if what if I went out and bought you a go-kart instead of, you know, playing taco football? I'm like, yeah, that sounds pretty cool. You know, I was always into the PlayStation 2, you know, NASCAR, you know, 04 and 05, I was always into it. And I started racing go-karts actually in 05. So that's just kind of how it all started and um, always made sure to surround ourselves with good people. And, um, you know, because my dad didn't know much about it. I obviously didn't at that age. And um, so we just, you know, got the right people around me to help make me successful in each and every level I've been to. So why, and it was dirt, oval go-karts yeah why was there like a track in town yeah so there was about three or four tracks within an hour of our house so um honestly i don't exactly know how my dad settled on you know dirt go-karts I, I think he heard of a track and we went to um we went to it was in cecil wisconsin high go raceway just to watch just to check it out we're walking around the pits and um you know there was a, a, a racer's dad that was kind of watching us wander around a little bit. And, um, and he was, you know, asking if we were interested and he got us hooked up with a local chassis dealer. And, uh, his name was Dave Sincula. He, uh, manufacturer, he, he was, uh, a dealer for Prowler chassis out of Florida. So we got hooked up with him and, um, got a, a new go-kart for, uh, the next season and built it over the off season. And, and went racing. It's uh, a race out of the back of our pickup for, I think, two years. Uh, so yeah. a lot of good times. No, for sure. That was, you know, some of my most fond memories going go-kart racing with my dad. Yeah, definitely. Um, so when, when did you get some success? Was it pretty quick? Like, or did it take some time? Yeah, it was decently quick, I think. Um, so I think I started racing in... I think it would have been June of 2005 and I won the day before my birthday that year in August. So, you know, about two months before my first win and it was decently competitive and you know, there's, I feel like, you know, once you win one, you're a kid and you expect to continually, you know, you want to keep doing that. Right. And it's not, it wasn't realistic. So there was, I think the next season, actually, I didn't win at all. And then the season after that, I, you know, blew up and won three of the local go-kart championships. And 
um, and then moved up in a national go-karts, I think in 2007, uh, won a couple national championships in the Midwest and um, then hopped into a late model. So how did that jump happen? Like that's a big jump, but everyone in go-karts ultimately has to make that jump unless you have a bazillion dollars behind you and you go each little, you know, incremental step. Uh, how did that jump happen from dirt go-karts to late model, yeah, so full-size stock cars? I'm glad you asked. Um, so we were at a national indoor karting championship every year over Thanksgiving. It's in Mississippi. Uh, this particular year it was uh, 2008 in Batesville. And it's kind of the big, um, I guess, off-season um, indoor karting championships every single year. And I think it's still going on to this day. Um, and Bobby Waltrip, who was Michael and Daryl's brother, um, okay. he was a commentator there. And that year I won, this is 2009, not 08. So 2009, I won three of the five races in my class and Bobby uh, came up to us after the, after the last race of the weekend and said, Hey, you know, uh, we think, you know, you have some talent, you know, we want to get you in a, a late model stock and, uh, we want you to go, you know, test North Carolina. I have a team set up. And, uh, so we went out and, uh, went to Hickory, North Carolina. I remember I was, I didn't know how to drive stick. I was, uh, 15 years old at the time, no idea how to drive a man, you know, a stick shift. And, uh, my dad went out and bought like a $500 S10, the little Chevy pickups. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm running laps. We have like a, a U-shaped driveway, and then it goes onto the road, so you can kind of make a circle. And so I'm out there just grabbing gears all day long, and in the winter time, drifting around, grabbing gears, learning how to drive stick shit before my test in Hickory uh, in February of that year. So uh, it's just kind of funny, you know, going back and you know thinking about all those moments that led to where I'm at today. It's pretty cool, but. Uh, yeah, I went out and, and tested that late model, and um, it went really well. Uh, they wanted us to, uh, you know, put together a, a deal, and you know, I think it might have been 10 or 12 races, and uh, we just didn't want to move and relocate to Carolina at that time. So we got hooked up with the team out of Wisconsin. Uh, it was the team that actually Ross Kenseth, uh, Matt's son, was racing for at the time and uh, got into a, a limited late model, uh, ran limited late models in 2010, 11 and then moved up into a super late model in 2012. So how did the, <laughs> that's funny. Like you obviously can't show up there and, and not know how to drive right. stick and embarrass yeah, exactly. yourself. So that's a, <laughs> that's a great story. Uh, how did the test go? Were you, were you quick? Like they, and they wanted to help you run and what did that program look like? You know, and I'm, it would have been astounding if they were to fund the whole thing. Was it a big check that you had to bring or were they going to really help you out in North Carolina? You know, I don't know. Um, that was, yeah. I was, like I said, 15 at the time. And, you know, my dad was really mostly handling all that. To my knowledge, I think we had to pay. Um, and it, yeah. it wasn't a crazy amount. I don't think racing was quite out of control um, as it is right now. I mean, some of these rent to ride deals are just incredible what they're getting for them. Um, but the team was actually Kiker Motorsports and Brandon Dean was their current driver at the time. And he raced, you know, Hickory and, and maybe the, you know, late model stock tour around uh, the Carolinas and Virginias. And, um, and actually Lee Pulliam then took over that program after uh, Brandon Dean. Lee Pulliam is probably one of the better late model stock racers in the, in the country. Um, but yeah, so I, I was in the car and ran a bunch of laps and then he jumped in it and we were very close to the same speed. Um, and I don't know if he was like going slow just to make us feel good about it. Right. I, I didn't know, mm, but uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, you never know. Right. Um, but uh, no, they wanted us to come down and, and do a, a limited schedule. And like I said, I believe we were having to, to pay for it uh, to my knowledge. Uh, and instead we put together a, a little bit more regional level deal. I think it was a better um, stepping stone for me. Um, even, you know, I don't know that there was a small stepping stone going from go-karts to late models. Just, they're just so much different, uh, obviously. So it was a, it was a big step. It was a learning curve for sure. It took me a few years to really get going, but, um, w one day it just, it just clicked and, uh, started winning races. So how come, you know, I guess, I guess 
how come you guys didn't want to move? Like it was, I guess, still pretty early. And what were your parents or what was your dad doing for work back home? Yeah, so my dad is an engineer by trade, but he, uh, you know, wasn't in engineering for a while. He went, you know, on the business side of his company. Um, his company designed and manufactured a lot of computer chips. So um, one of their biggest projects that they did um, was actually a project that everybody would know is the, you know, the Coke machine that you can go and you can pick all the different flavors out. And um, I don't know. Oh, if, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah. Uh, they, they designed the computer chip for that. And there's and it's actually a pretty sophisticated machine. It, it basically, I don't know if you ever experienced this, if you go to different regions, like if you have a Mountain Dew in New York versus California, the mineral composition of the water is different and it might taste a little bit different. Well, that machine would, you know, sense that and make the composition of the water similar. So Coke would taste the same wherever you were at in the, in the country or whatever type of water you were putting into it. So, um, and then they were in, into um, a lot of, you know, hospital x-rays and um, hospital equipment and stuff like that. So that's what he was doing back home um, at the time. And we just didn't want to relocate, right? I, you know, we were both in, you know, really obviously deep into school. My sister is three years younger than me. So she would have been 12 at the time. And I don't think, I don't think my dad necessarily knew that I was, that it was worth it at that point. You know, I don't think he knew if I was good or not, right. I, there was a lot to learn about my development at that time. So I just don't think he wanted to take the risk, uh, to make, to, to make that move to, to Carolina and wanted to stay in Wisconsin. Right. So you guys run your limited late model, uh, what out of like, a out of your own shop back home. So it was, it was a rental deal. So, uh, it was yep. with the team that, uh, Ross Kenzel was, was racing for out of Sun Prairie, Wisconsin. Okay. And, um, and they had, a, a, I think they ran maybe three or four in-house cars at the time. Uh, I had a pretty good program, learned a lot from them. And uh, we were with them from 2010 to 2012. And then I moved on from them in 2013. And the team I moved to, I'm still with today when I run my super late model. So um, been with them for, I guess this will be year 11 now. Wow. So... You know, obviously you're known for winning a shit ton of super late model races and, and running all over the country. When did that, when did you hit that stride in the super late model? Yeah, I think it was a combination of a couple of things. Um, to answer your question, the, the year that really jump started my career, we won. So the ARCA Midwest Tour Championship or the ARCA Midwest Tour is a series, the main super late model series in Wisconsin travels to the surrounding states about 10, 11 races a year. Um, so I won the championship in my rookie season in 2014, um, won, I think maybe five races total that year. Uh, we ran more than just those 11 races. Um, you know, we ran, you know, different specials and parts of different series, but, um, the Midwest tour was the premier series. So, uh, we won two Midwest tour races that year and five total races might've ran 30 races total. And in 2015, I applied to be a part of the driver, uh, the quickie driver development program. Um, and I got explain that. What's that? Explain what that is for people. So the quickie driver development program, Alan, the late Alan quickie, uh, passed away in a, in a plane accident on his way to Bristol. Um, he was from Wisconsin originally, um, raised super late models, um, had a dream in NASCAR, literally just moved by himself to Carolina, wanted to start a race team did it, uh, eventually became a cup champion as an owner, driver, crew chief, wore all the hats, right? Very, a very historic figure in racing that, that, that maybe is not given the amount of publicity or praise that he deserves. What he did was truly the first person to really ever do it the way he did it. Um, so a few of his, I'll, I'll say, Wikiites because that's what they call them themselves. Tom Roberts runs the program. Paul Andrews, which is part of his championship winning team, uh, is on the board. Um, and, and there's a handful of others. Tony Gibson, he was a crew chief at uh, Stuart Haas for a while, worked with Allen in his championship season. So a lot of a lot of the Kowickiites got together, wanted to make a driver development program. Um, 
and basically it's they take seven drivers right you can apply to it they take seven drivers per year and they give you seven thousand seven hundred and seventy seven dollars to go race that season or put it to work towards whatever you want it to and um the winner at the end of the year gets a grand prize of seven times that number it ends up being fifty four thousand uh, x amount of dollars so the point system is based off of what you do on track and off track. So community service, right? Representing Allen. Um, there's just a number of things you can do. What I did was I started a driver development program similar to their program, but just at a lower level in go-kart. So I went back to my local go-kart track, like we talked about before, took seven drivers and had basically the same competition as I was competing in my competition. So it was kind of a neat idea and it, and it worked out. And um, that whole program really launched me to really push myself on and off the track that season. I think we ran 40 some races, one over, uh, over 20 of them. And that's really wow. the year that really kicked off my career. Um, and then we followed it up the following season, ran 54 races. We won 28 of them. And that's when I signed my driver development deal with Roush and then, was a part of the NASCAR Next program with yourself. So it all just snowballed from really from 2015 um, in that quickie program on. Wow. Wow. You guys ran a lot of races. A lot of races. During, that's crazy. And a winning percentage that's, you know, unheard of. Um, man, so you're known for among some guys. Well, actually – you know, funny when we first met uh, in the NASCAR Next deal, when everyone was kind of being introduced, like I was, I didn't even know what NASCAR Next was, you know, and I was so far removed from the NASCAR scene and the late model scene and everything. And when you showed up, everyone was asking you these eye racing questions. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I, and I had, I had got on eye racing like a month before that NASCAR Next deal. You you were like w number one and two account yeah. in in the world at that time. Like, let's just talk about that. When did you get on iRacing, and and when did you realize, hey, there's something here? Yeah, so that's funny that you asked that. So actually, before I did that test, so um, back to the previous story we were talking about when Bobby Waltrip wanted me to do that test in Carolina. While I was driving that S10, learning how to drive stick shift, he's like, hey, you've got to get eye racing, right? Uh, and get, you know, just and run laps in a, in a stock car. Even though it's not the same, you still get the proximity of where the wall's at versus where you're at, right? You get that vision of it. So I got on eye racing in 2000, that would have been 2010, like really early 2010. And, um, I bought this old steering wheel from a guy who did our ear molds. He was a, like, uh, was a supplier of RE and I was in, yep. I was in his basement getting my ear molds done for that test. And he's like, Hey, uh, I saw that steering wheel sitting there. I'm like, Hey, you know, where, where do you get one of those steering wheels? I'm, I'm looking at getting into iRace and he goes, Hey, you can, you can have it for a hundred bucks. And I'm like, all right, cool. So I gave him a hundred bucks set it all up and that is still the st same steering wheel I'm using today. Yeah. Crazy. So, uh, it's uh, kind of a funny story, but, um, yeah, so I started iRacing in 2010. It, it's hard to get going on there. There's a lot of, there's a lot you need to, you just need to do it and figure it out right from the setups to, um, you know, the settings and all the wheel, you know, everything really needs to be perfect to figure it out. And I got this setup for a late model stock in like 2012 and that like it something just clicked then I just started winning a ton of races with that setup it was a Martinsville setup and I started to I didn't know exactly like what the what I needed to do with the setup but once I got a baseline I was able to adjust it for each track and then it, my ice eye racing career just took off from there so um, it's just crazy how those little moments through all your career, you go back and be like, man, that, that was the turning point, you know, and a big reason why I've made it to this point. So it's pretty cool. Yeah. You're, uh, certainly, 
you know, it's iconic, your setup right yeah, now. Right. Like you ex explain what you're working with, you know, in this day and age after COVID, everyone's got three screens, killer computer, you know, giant force, you know, giant direct drive right. wheel, Formula One style pedals. Uh, what are you working with? So I just have, so that wheel I told you I just bought was just a, a used Logitech G27 wheel and pedals. And um, actually I'm off of my old iRacing laptop. I get about a new laptop because it peters out after about three or four years. Uh, so I get a new laptop. So I just race off of a laptop, that steering wheel. The reason I do it is because I know if I get an actual SIM unit. I live in three different places. I had a house in Charlotte. Uh, my parents in Wisconsin. I'm in Ohio now. I have always been that way my whole career. And I know from, you know, racing on other people's fancy sim rigs that you get used to it. And then you go back to mm -hmm. your little one with a laptop and a steering wheel and it takes you a bit to get back into it. So always being on the road, I can just fold down my laptop and Logitech G27 wheels are it, very inexpensive. So I have three of those in my three different locations that I go to, and I can just easily go to each different place and have the same exact sim rig instead of um, having a fancy one somewhere and having to, you know, get used to my cheap ones. So it's just the way it's worked out. But once I settle down somewhere, I'll probably get something nice. Right. I've uh, I've recently been on a pretty good one. I built one for my dad in his basement before he. Uh you know, to give him some testing before he does some of the, he's doing some TA2 races. Okay, so he's yeah. down at Sebring right now. I love TA2 but, uh, cars. It's, oh, me too. Yeah. Yeah, awesome. yeah. That would be. So yeah, it's worth his while, uh, you know, way cheaper than a single test day to go yeah, have right. a serious setup that he can go learn some tracks and, and do that. So I've been, I've been driving that and it's, yeah, it's totally, my my initial setup was almost the exact same as yours right. and to go back to that now would be so oh, hard yeah. especially on the on the road course stuff mm -hmm. like it's really really hard to react once you've had the taste of you know the the feedback in the in the wheel yeah. um that's a tough oh, deal yeah. so how do you go back and forth between like say a manufacturer sim and then your setup yeah so that's an interesting question. Yeah, we do a lot of sim, you know, through our manufacturers, and those are all out. I would say it's it's almost so much different that it it doesn't mess you up. Like, hmm. I guess that's the best way I can explain it. You know, I'm not taking, you know, a late model that I at Martinsville that I run on i racing on my on my you know fancy rig and then go back and run that same exact setup at the same exact track you know, you, you're getting a rhythm with how you brake with a, you know, a real set of pedals, say, and force feedback and all that kind of stuff. And you go to something that's not like that. It's just so much different, like a totally different discipline that it, it doesn't seem to affect me too much. Right. Right. I, I've, I was in the uh, Toyota sim once and it was astounding. Like I always explained, people were like, what was it like? And, and I'm like, honestly, if you had like knocked me out and then I came to in the rig and we were running most port before the truck race, I'm like, I think it would have taken me almost a corner two to realize I wasn't in a real truck. Like I wasn't in a real car, like the noise, the heat, it's insane in those things. I know it is wild how, just how realistic they can get it, you know, and the way the, how far the tire models have come and the, and the visuals and the 3d glasses that you wear, just the whole thing is just phenomenal. It's, it's incredible how far it's come and we haven't seen, this is probably just scraping the tip of the iceberg. Totally. So when did iRacing contact you? So like at what point? Yeah. So when I became, so it was a big thing, like, when I was about to get to 10,000 I rating for you, I racers, it's kind of like at that time I was getting close and it was like uncharted territory. And actually one of my buddies from I racing emailed them and said, Hey, this, this guy's getting, you know, close to 10,000 I rating. And they, they responded back and they almost thought it was just going to stop at 9,999. <laughs> Like they thought that it was just going to stop, but it didn't like Y2K. Yeah. Right. And that was going to be yeah. it. That was going to be, that's it. I beat the game. No, <laughs> but, uh, 
So that's what they thought was going to happen. And, and they're like, geez, you know, they looked up my name and then reached out to me and said, Hey, you know, this, um, you know, your buddy gave you my con or, uh, you know, gave, gave us your contact. We wanted to reach out and, um, and they knew I was, I was, that was, this was in, let's see the off season going into 2015. Uh, they were on my car for the first time in February of 15 at speed weeks. And, um, I remember, you know, just putting the deal together and man, it was just so cool to put that iRacing logo on the car. I remember I was just so pumped about it. Um, and, uh, they've been with me there they, we just, uh, did another, you know, just our late model deal with them again. Uh, they were on my first Xfinity race with Roush Fenway in 2017. They were on a couple of my truck races with Nice, uh, in 2020. So they've been a huge supporter of mine, uh, on and off the racetrack. It's, it's good to have good people supporting you and, and a great product like that. How many hours were you putting in a day or a week, like in your peak, Ooh. in your prime? I don't know that I want to even say. <laughs> I think the people have to know. Oh, man. I don't even – it's hard to put. I remember I would, you know, in, in college I was in my dorm room and I I had my – my bed was – and my dorm was on top. And then underneath my bed was my desk with my eye racing steering wheel and – I, I know I would get done with class and I'd go and I race. And that was really in, I think, I, I don't remember what year I actually got to 10 K, but I'm pretty sure I was in college at the time. So that would have been in like 13 or 14, that would have been 14 or 15 time frame. And uh, yeah, I was doing a lot of I racing then and enough to get two accounts to 10,000 and well over it. So I don't know. It was a lot of hours a week. I know I would get back from class about 5 30, 6 o'clock. And if I didn't have much going on, I was on until about 11, probably five times a day. So it was, uh, wow. in my prime, I was into it, man. It was, uh, it was a lot of fun. Um, I don't regret any of it looking back at it. I'd met some great people. And I think that's the thing that maybe people don't realize about iRacing is the people you can meet on there. I made, you know, um, really big contacts with Dale Jr., Brad Keselowski, TJ Majors, just through iRacing. And um, everybody in the racing community, most probably have iRacing in some way, shape, or form, or have done it. It's just a tightly knit family, and you just never know who you're going to run into on there. I've gotten countless sponsors, and like I said, I just name-dropped those guys. Just the people that you meet on there, um, it, it certainly shaped my career, not only from a a driving perspective, but just from a networking perspective as well. Right. Right. So jump ahead now, you know, you have this banger year in 2014, 2015. Uh, we meet, we're in the NASCAR next deal. Now, you, now again, you're, I guess beyond iRacing, you're formally introduced to the NASCAR world, uh, having never done a NASCAR race still just running late model stuff. Uh, how does the Roush deal come up, come about and explain what that is? Yeah. So originally, um, the guy who really fired off that relationship, excuse me, was, um, Gary Rulo. He owned and ran Rulo brothers racing. They won the championship with Chris Busher. They were an Arca series team. They won the championship with Chris Busher, I think in 2000 and, I think in 2011 or 2012 right around that time frame and they were a, a roush affiliate so had a lot of contacts with roush yates where they got their engines from and they actually ran some of their some of their cars came out of roush's shop um even though they were located in the chicago area and i was at a it was slinger nationals of 2015 i didn't qualify real well um, we had to actually take a provisional to get into the race. It's Slinger Nationals, for those of you that don't know, is probably the Midwest's biggest race of the year. It's a little quarter-mile bull ring. Always, it's always a, a Tuesday night race. Attracts NASCAR drivers. Matt Kenseth has won, I think, um, seven or eight of them. Kyle Busch has won there. Right, The list goes on and on. And I had to start in the back, and, and Gary Rulo was there just watching the race, and um, I, I came from, like I said, had to start in the back with taking a provisional. Um, it was a 200 lap race. 
I ended up getting up into second and I was running down the leader with like, it was under 15 to go. And I was, the sense of urgency was high because it was going to be tight for me to catch him. So I actually spun out a lapper, not on purpose, but trying to, you know, I didn't want to go to the yeah. outside of him, right? I want to get to the bottom of him. So I spun him out, had to go to the back and didn't win the race. I think I finished fourth or fifth or something. And, um, and he came up to us after the race and, and said, Hey, we need to, we need to talk. And I didn't know who this guy was. And, uh, we wanted to, so we went, you know, he, he basically name dropped me to Roush and he was sort of the middleman. Um, he set up a meeting with, uh, Jack and some of the other higher ups at Roush Fenway at the time, set up a meeting. We put a driver development deal together. Um, it was basically a two year development deal and they could pick up my option to sign me to a contract at any point. Um, okay. So that was in 2016, and in that contract, I was going to run, I think, five or six races with the Rulo brothers that season. Um, so fast forward to 2016, the summer months, my first ARCA race with Rulo brothers was at Madison. I think it was probably June-ish, and uh, I think we finished fourth. And then we went to Chicago. We were, that was the time where all the new composite bodies were in coming into ARCA. Gary just had a, Rulo Brothers just had a steel body. So for those of you that don't know, the composite bodies are substantially better than the steel bodies. Uh, we went out and finished six at Chicago with a steel body car. And after that, Roush actually picked up my contract and signed me to an actual driver's agreement. So that contract was a seven-year contract. And it was, you know, assuming I was going to be in cup after year, I want to say after year four, obviously that never happened. There's always ways out of these, right? You sign long-term deals. Everybody's got ways out, right? It's just kind of the way the world is. So you sign these contracts and it's cool. It was, it was, it was really cool at the time. And it really got me in the NASCAR funnel. And it was my first real opportunity. Um, you know, I ran those arc races in 2016 worked in the shop full time with, for them in 17 as a shot guy, uh, at Roush Fenway and then ran, I believe five ARCA races that year in 17 and three, um, nationwide or Xfinity races at the time. And 2018, then I ran 12 races with the infamous program 60, which was pretty much right. a catastrophe. Right. So, um, so that was kind of my tenure with Roush and that was my first real opportunity. And, um, even though it didn't go well, I, I certainly learned a lot and, 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 and gave me a lot of lessons and turned me into the driver and person I am today. So when you signed that contract, the actual contract in your mind, if you go back to that time where you're like, Hey, I'm going to cup, yeah. I'm going to be driving. I'm going to be a cup racer for Roush. I mean, I, I thought there was a really good chance of that. And I knew I knew at the time Roush's equipment wasn't maybe where they wanted it to be. And they were, and they, and they were vocal about that. They knew that. And, you know, they, I felt like, you know, between Ford's support, because Ford was a huge part of the program 60, almost single-handedly funding that entire program for uh, Chase Briscoe, Austin Sindrick and I, and it just, it just didn't, it just didn't work. Um, yeah. So ex explain to people who didn't watch that season. So it's Xfinity. So it's the Saturday night. It's, it's the second level, you know, not the highest level. And this car was split between you three young guys and Ford guys. And this was like a development program, right? Correct. And what was interesting about it is we, we each kind of had our separate ways. So a lot of people looked at it as a competition and it wasn't that at all. I had my avenue through Roush. Chase had his avenue through Stuart Haas. And of course, Austin had his through Penske. So we really weren't competing for anything, but we're all young guys, right? And we all had talent to get to that point, right? We all we all could do it, right? We all wanted to beat each other, right? We all wanted to outperform the, the you know, the the next guy, right? Naturally. And I think there it was a combination of us really trying too hard and trying to prove ourselves when maybe we just weren't ready to do that. And, and also with where Roush's Xfinity program was at at the time. And we were just, 
I was trying to, you know, take a maybe a 12th or 13th place car and finish in the top five with it. And we got ourselves in trouble. And I don't know how many incidents. I, I remember seeing a graphic somewhere and it was just, we, we, we averaged over an incident a race in that car, meaning a, a spin, just some kind of accident of some sort. It was, it was just a bad deal and it, it just did not work. And um, so they, you know, Chase went on to run full time for Stuart Haas the following season, Austin at Penske and Roush actually shut down their Xfinity program. So um, after 2018, I was, I was basically out of a job. Right. So it was because, you know, I guess there was no opportunity for them to take you to cup that that season didn't go well. And they just said, all right, you know, um, you get, we're parting ways. Yeah. So basically in the contract, it stayed, I had to run two races the first year. I believe it was, I want to say it was 10 the second year, which would have been 2018, the program 60 year. Um, I ended up running 12. And the following year, it was in the contract. I had to be full time. Um, and, you know, and, and after year two, there was basically an out for each side. So that was their time to either either find a sponsor and put me in a car, which they were which they were trying to do. Or if they couldn't find a sponsor, um, they, either, they either were going to fund it or, or fire me. Um, so they mm-hmm. decided that, you know, as a, I think as, I think there was a lot of factors going into that. First of all, I don't think that I did well enough. I didn't perform well enough. And second of all, I think they weren't performing how they wanted to on the cup side. So I really think they wanted to take all those assets from the Xfinity side, focused on getting their cup program where they needed to. So I think it was a, it was a combination of things and it, it wasn't a, a bad breakup by any means. I, mean, I still talk to a lot of those guys today and um, I secretly still, still root for them. Uh, they're the ones that gave me my first, my first big chance, right? They paid me to drive a race car. I didn't have to bring any funding, right? There's for a guy like me that those opportunities are few and far in between. So for them to have taken that chance on me, um, I'll, I'll forever be thankful for that. So no bad blood there. Just didn't, uh, just the timing wasn't right. For sure. Now, were you in college at the time? Yeah. So I was in college in 2015 or 2014 2015 2016 when i signed the deal i moved to charlotte i dropped out of college so i actually don't have my engineering degree um i was always going to go back and if i needed to but i just wanted to put everything i had into being a race car driver because i felt like i wasn't bringing a check so i feel like i had to sign i had to i had to set myself apart from everybody else in some way other than money and my way of doing that was was being all in by working at the shop, right? Being the simulator driver, right? In, in my tenure with Roush, I was in the simulator two, three times a week because the cup guys weren't big on it. So I was that I was the sim guy for them. So there was a lot of stuff I did behind the scenes to really set myself apart. And, um, and, I, and I felt like I, I couldn't go to college and, and do that at the same time. So I uh, made the decision to, to not finish college and, and go all in on being a race car driver. Right. And I, I'm assuming, but, uh, you know, your parents were cool with that. Yeah. I mean, they were, I mean, it was some serious conversations, right? It was, it was something that was going to shape my life good or bad. Right. Um, if it didn't work out, got to go back to school and finish and have a normal job. Um, thankfully so far, it hasn't turned out that way. Um, still keeping my head above water some, some years barely, but, um, no, it's, it's been a great ride, roller coaster ride for sure. And, um, but yeah, we made the decision together to, to make the move to Charlotte and, um, me and my girlfriend at the time got an apartment, um, just, just outside of the Roush race shop on Concord mills there in Charlotte. And, or, um, yeah, just made the big leap. Right. Right. So that deal ends and I'm assuming you don't have any prospects for the next season. How did like how did that feel? Like you seem like a pretty happy go lucky guy, pretty optimistic guy, and you I guess you still have your super late model that you can race. So was it was it hard when that deal ended or was it put my head down and go to work? Um it was disappointing, but I felt like with how the previous season went, you know, it would have it would have been really hard even if I was full time to really turn that program around 
within the off season, right? And I, I always wanted I. I I don't want to say I didn't have fun at Roush, right? Because I did, and I learned a lot. But I'm accustomed to going to the racetrack under the assumption I have a chance to win, right? And if I can't do that, it's not as fun for me. I just and 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 there are guys that that can go to the racetrack and and do the start and park deal, right, and make a living driving a race car, and they're okay with going to the racetrack and and not having a chance to win. And there's and that's great, right? I just can't do that. I can't do it. I'd rather go back, have a normal job, than go to the racetrack and not have a chance to win. That's just my mentality, right or wrong. That's just how I am. And I'm just so competitive uh, from that standpoint. And um, yeah, just it was it was disappointing at the time, but I, I knew if I could land on my feet that there could be some potential for, for something better. And um what happened was, was I, I obviously, like you said, always had my late model program, ran a bunch of races that year. We hit on a really good package in 2019 on our late model program. Um, I think our winning percentage, we didn't, I didn't run many races, um, but our winning percentage was just crazy that season. I think it was, it was my, it might've been 12 for 16 races or something. And we went to I'm trying to think how this went. So early in 2019, when I got fired from Roush, Ford wanted me to still work for them. So I actually signed a contract with Ford, uh, the manufacturer, obviously. And I was their sim driver, and I was the I was the backup wheel force car tester. So the wheel force car is a cup car that has $400,000 of sensors on it per wheel. So you don't want to wreck this thing. Whew. Yeah. So... This thing, it would sense, you know, slip angles and, and tire deflection. And it was basically to collect tire data for the manufacturer. Um, so wow. each manufacturer has one. I think at the time, David Reagan, I think he still is um, the wheel force driver. And I think um, for Toyota, it was I'm trying to think who it was. I slip in my mind, but um a big job. So I never actually got to drive the wheel force car, which was maybe good or bad. Um, it would have been cool to do, but a lot of pressure. Um, but I did do a lot of sim for him that year. I picked up uh, six ARCA races with Chad Bryant Racing in 19. Uh, one Charlotte, Pocono, and Chicago. Uh, finished second at Michigan. Fourth at Talladega. It might have been it. And, um, and I did one truck race with Nice Motorsports at the end in 2019. So, um, won those three ARCA races early on in that season, I get a text from Phil Gold, who was the crew chief at, um, Nice Motorsports at the time. Phil Gold was Ryan Reed's crew chief at Roush when I was his teammate. So I knew Phil. Okay. And he knew I was kind of out of a ride and they were in a position where um, they want, they needed a driver to fill in some races. It was supposed to be seven races at the time. It fell through. Kyle Benjamin came in, uh, brought some money to the program. He ended up doing those races. They threw me in one race at the end of 2019. It was Phoenix, uh, the race before the championship. Uh, At the time, Ross Chastain was running full-time, running for a championship with Nice. Won a bunch of races that year. Uh, we went out, we qualified fifth and ran 10th at Phoenix. Ross was moving on and Al signed me to a full-time deal shortly after that for 2020. And, um, and that's kind of what propelled me into my next opportunity. So, um, 2019 was a very slim on the NASCAR side, one truck race, five or six arc races and late models. Right. Right. So let's jump to that knee steel now it's your first opportunity to go race for a championship in nascar yeah i thought it was a great opportunity the team's coming off of a four or five win season um yep right finished second in the championship with ross um i thought i was in a a really good spot so a couple different things happened um i feel i think so during the time nice was transitioning from a GMS affiliated team and they started hanging their own bodies, building their own chassis in house during that time, going from a 
truck and a half to two truck team to basically a four truck team. So I think that I think I'd call it a one truck team. Yeah. I mean, there was four trucks going to the racetrack. So there was, it was just, you know, I don't know how to put this because I like the guys at Nice, right? And they, and they, again, I didn't have to bring any money to this program. Right. But I just, I think that it was a lot to take in for one off season, right? You're starting to hang all your own bodies, build all your own chassis, add two teams, right? It was just a lot. And they were really big on practicing. And that's what Ross and Phil were really good at was practicing and dialing their truck in. 2020 happens. We go to Vegas, or I go to Daytona, end up on my lid, go to Vegas, had a decent run at Vegas, qualified four, third or fourth, ran in the top 10. COVID hits, right? Now we're off for a month and a half, two months. Come back. Okay. There's going to be no practice, nothing, right? Go, I'm going to racetracks. I haven't been to, to this point. I've only really run those 12 races with Roush, couple Arca races. So even though it was my third or fourth year in the game, I've only, I maybe have 20 races total. And a lot of them were on the same racetrack. So I'm going into 2020 with, a team I felt like maybe bit off more than what they could chew and me not having any experience at a lot of these racetracks. It just was not the right timing. I don't think it was anything they did. It wasn't anything, you know, it just wasn't the right time with where they were at with and with where my experience level was at. And um, it just didn't work. Once we uh, fast forward to September of that season, ran very mediocre all year. Um, the last playoff race or the last regular season race was Darlington. This was September. Um, after we basically ran the regular season and didn't make the playoffs, uh, they put Trevor Bain in in my truck and, uh, let me go. Did that, did that hurt your confidence or did you go watch what this guy's going to do? Like, you know, it's, it's not me. Um, I think throughout the season, Ross, Ross was ran part-time and, you know, he's like, man, this stuff just isn't what it was last year, you know? And Mm. I, and I, and I'm not saying that I was as good as him because I don't think I was. Um, He would, you know, I felt like he could get the most out of that equipment and he, and when he would show up and run, he was nowhere near where he was the year before. Um, so I, I knew that it necessarily wasn't me, but unfortunately we're in a, the, in racing, it's a lot of how people perceive an opportunity, right? So yep, yep. last year he goes out and wins a champion or almost wins a championship, wins five races. I get in it and I'm flopping like a fish all year. Right. So that's how it's perceived by everybody. And, you know, I didn't, I thought after 2020, I was like, all right, I'm going to give this off season you know, try and try and find a sponsor, right? Try and land on my feet somewhere. If it doesn't work out, I'm just, I'm going to, you know, I'm, my dream is to be a NASCAR driver, right? And, and race for a living, but you've got to be realistic about it. You can't just keep going down a rabbit hole that just isn't realistic. And I felt like I was, I was pretty, I'm a pretty realistic guy and a pretty matter of fact guy. And that's, I came kind of came to terms with that. And I was okay with, putting all my effort in trying to land on my feet for this would have been for 2021. And if it didn't work out, I was just going to uh, go race late models and um, go back and, and be a regular guy. Yeah. Yeah. It's to, I guess to back up to that, um, that truck season, did you listen to Justin Marks on juniors podcast? I did not No. He had a good point because I guess he got he ra- he raced a season of trucks when he was pretty young and he put it put it together, and and maybe you can relate to this maybe maybe it's because you've done so much i racing and you did all that stuff for Roush it doesn't hit for you but it really hit for me. He was he was like I didn't know how to drive the thing like I I did however many races and I just didn't understand the truck like I was just over driving it, and I felt like when I jumped from our Canadian NASCAR to the truck, you know, bias ply tires to radial tires, truck arm, you know, 
that I what I know now, like I can't believe I even drove the truck like that. Was that the case, you know, for you a little bit? Are there things that you know now that you look back and you go, man, I really could have done better during that season? Yeah, for sure. And I think, I think, you know, again, I was always getting compared to Ross that season and, and rightfully so. I don't, I'm not blaming anybody for that because that's the right thing to do. Um, Mm. I think that I was probably trying to, again, the same thing at Roush. I was probably trying to over, overperform where the truck was capable of running and, and whether that was, you know, the lack of communication on my part with, with the crew chief, or that was, you know, the equipment or it was my experience level, my feedback, whatever it was, we, it, I was trying to, uh, you know, overperform for where we were going to run that day. I got myself in some bad spots and, uh, we ran very mediocre. I don't know how many top tens we had that season. It might've been four or five, um, not very good. And, you know, it, I don't know. It's, it's just crazy to go back and think about all the different factors that played a role in that. It's it the the, the trucks are are so much different. And require you to be so aggressive because the trucks create so many runs. the The runs are so big, and I just I don't know that I was confident or ready for that change from how the Xfinity and ARCA cars race compared to the trucks. Um, you really just have to race like an ass in the truck series that's just what you have mm. to do you got to throw the blocks you got to make the quick moves that's going to piss the guy off and that's just that's just how you have to race them and that's how you maintain track position because it's hard to pass and dirty air is yeah. so bad with the with how big and bulky the trucks are they poke such a big hole in the air you've got to gouge and claw for all the track position you can get. And that doesn't mean just on the racetrack that's coming in and out of pit road. Your pit crew needs to be good. There's so many factors that go into that. And I just think I, I wasn't ready to perfectly execute on all levels the way I needed to, to be successful in the truck series at that time. Right. So now for a second time, you're out of a ride You've made this ultimatum with yourself. Hey, I'm going to give it one more shot. I'm going to, you know, do whatever it takes. Um, tell us where that goes. This is, a good, this is a good one. So this leads to where I am today, right? Wrapping it all up. So Rulo Brothers 2016, right? My first ARCA race is when I first signed my Ford driver development deal or uh, Roush driver development deal. David Pepper was the spotter, Okay. So David okay. Pepper is the GM of Thor Sport right now. So where you're at right now. Where I'm at right now. So September of 2020, right, after Darlington, I get fired from Nice. I'm like, man, I was close with Chase Briscoe. We became friends during the program 60. I'm like, hey, man, you got, you know, they, these guys just fired me. Um, you know, do you, have, do you have David Pepper's number? And he goes, yeah texted it to me and I call Pepper. I'm like, Pepper, I know we haven't, I hadn't talked to him really since, you know, he spotted for me at the end of 2016. And I said, Pepper, I know you guys don't have anything, you know, but you know, I just, I just got fired and I don't, I don't feel like I was given a fair opportunity. And I said, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd love to have the opportunity to just come and, and check out the shop and build a relationship with you guys. And, and just see where it goes. He's like, oh yeah, yeah. Um, you know, if you want to come up and on your way back from from Charlotte to, to Wisconsin, Ohio's a, a little bit out of the way. You know, next time on your way back, you know, just shoot me a text and stop in. Well, I wasn't going back to Wisconsin, but I was in Ohio the next week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? You know, yeah, I'm going back yeah. to Wisconsin. <laughs> so I'm up in Ohio yeah. the next week, right? <laughs> uh, and uh, he showed me around the shop and uh we run into Duke Thorson, who is the team owner, um, stop by his office, chat with him for 20, 25 minutes, made it very clear. I, I was interested, felt like I haven't been given a fair shot, you know, shared my Midwest values. I know he's, he's from, he was, he's from Minnesota. Um, so, and he's, you know, I race against Johnny Sauter a lot on the late model side. 
So he knew of me from racing against Johnny. Johnny has been one of his drivers for years. And um, so he knew of me and stuff. And he's like, yeah, you know, I don't, I don't know what we have now, but uh, we'll keep you in mind. So I'm like, all right. So I go, go back and, and run some late model races and, you know, uh, September, October, November, 2020, December of 2020, we go down to the snowball derby, biggest super late model race in the country every single year. Uh, we go and we win. And a few days later, Pepper calls me, Hey, um, we don't have anything full time for you right now, but Duke really wants you up here. We, we want to give you an offer to come up here, work as an engineer, um, be the engineer on your own truck. We're going to give you a, a handful of races per year. Um, and, and if it goes well, um, some of our other drivers, you know, we, we might have an opening within the next few years, a few years, you know, two or three, you know, maybe longer than that. Right. Yeah. At the time I had another opportunity I was working on with another team in the truck series it would have put me in more races that season for 2021. Mm. It was like maybe eh, seven to 10 races with the option of not the option with, a, with like two or three Xfinity races on top of that. And I was going to have to bring money and have funding for those. And, and we, we had it um, or, or most of it. And I decided I'm like, man, you know, I just, how, how long is it sustainable, right? You, you battle this, right? How, how long can you sustain bringing X amount, hundred thousand dollars per year to do seven or 10 races? And can I get it to 2 million to make it a full season? Right. Yep. I'm like, man, you know, I just think, I just think my, my opportunity at longevity in the sport, I felt better about coming up here uh, to Thor sport. So I took the deal. Um, no contract, right. There's very old school. Um, but, but just really good people up here. So, um, I took the risk to basically put racing on hold for a year. Uh, only ran four or five races. Uh, it was actually four. It was, um, Charlotte, Nashville, Gateway and, and Pocono was the fourth one. And, uh, Ran my late model, of course, simultaneously. So I'd travel back, run my late model in Wisconsin, be back at work for Monday, drove through the night. I don't know how many times after Sunday races uh, to get back for work right away on Monday morning. And that's just what I did for a year. And uh, we had a, a couple top tens um, at Charlotte. I think we finished eighth at Charlotte, seventh at Nashville. Was running in the top five at Gateway with a chance to win. Got a wreck on the front stretch. Uh, late in the in the final stage and um, the timing was just right uh, one of their other driver there's basically a seat open and um, you know basically put me in the truck for uh, the 2022 season and um, the rest is history right on right on so uh, 2022 season what do you have three wins two two wins yep two wins two wins you make it to the final four, like you're you're doing it now. Like, do you do you feel or did you feel uh, that you got some redemption? Yeah, no doubt about it. I, I think for those people that were really just specifically NASCAR fans, didn't know me from what I done, what I've done on the short track ranks. You know, to them, I was just a joke, right? I mean, I, I get this opportunity with Roush that was supposed to work out. You know, wrecked a bunch of stuff there. Went to went to Nice. Wrecked a bunch of stuff there, right? And, and seemingly a really good ride. Um, and, and you know, to these people, I'm just, you know, and, and, and maybe to some people in the industry that didn't know me, um, right? I, they're like, geez, this guy, you know? And I really wanted, I felt like with the right, with the experience level, with, my, with the right amount of experience and the right opportunity with the right race team at the right time, I knew I could be successful. I think that's maybe something that some people don't understand about racing is you can be completely capable of winning a cup race or an Xfinity race or a truck race. But if you're not with the right team, with the right people at the right time, it's not, it's not going to work. Um, and on the same token, you can 
you can take the best team, the best truck, and if the driver isn't ready, it's, it's still not going to work. So it goes both ways. You have to have all of it. The timing of, that it takes to, to be successful, it takes some doing. And, and I think like it does take some time. You know, the, the armchair racer or the guy watching on the couch, I don't think really appreciates how hard it is to, to line everything up and, and win. Yeah, and that's the thing, and especially on a consistent basis, because you're always going to be racing somebody at that level that has that kind of chemistry and equipment, right? There's somebody, there's always somebody or multiple that are multiple teams that are going to have that cohesiveness. And um, that was something that I felt like with me being here at the shop for being a, the first time working together with this team, I was able to accelerate that learning curve uh, it, throughout the season. And we, we got better and better each and every race and our communication got better. And we got to the point where we were winning, we were winning races at the end of the year and, um, had a chance to win the championship with, with under five to go at Phoenix. And that, that's all you can ask for. Yeah. Uh, I was rooting for you. Um, so now you're doing it again this year. Do you have like a five year plan, 10 year plan? Obviously you want to be a cup racer. Yeah. Yes and no. Um, and that might not, that answer might surprise you. I think over the course of my career and being in Charlotte and, 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 and living that, um, that life. Cause I was, you know, being, being an Xfinity and being with a, with a cup team, um, you know, I was racing Xfinity for that team, but it was with a cup team. So I'm in the shop every day seeing how, how cup, how, the, how it works, right. From the business side, from the commitment side, from, um, just the, the duties that you have to do to be a cup driver. I, I was all in on doing that. And I, don't, and, I and I still would be today but it is, it is far from what you and I know is racing, right? That's, you know, scaling your car and, and loading up at midnight, right, to make it to the racetrack, you know, cutting clips off and adjusting control arm mounts and all that, you know, it's, it's just so much not racing, right? It's, mm -hmm. you show up to the racetrack, you, you take care of your sponsor obligations and, you know, you go through all the motions and, and you know, you get out of your sponsor appearance and change into your suit and you're in the car and you don't even like a lot of the drivers don't even know what, what they're even driving. And I just, and I would do that. It was always been my dream and I'm not saying that I wouldn't. Um, but it would take one hell of a deal to peel me away from where I'm at right now. These guys are, you know, Duke and Rhonda are great to work with. The team I have is phenomenal. I'm six hours from my house in Wisconsin um, I can go race my late models. It's 23 weekends out of the year, you know, and, I, and I'm making a living driving race cars. And, um, and I, I, you know, I can't, I can't think of a happier time in, in my life than what I am right now. So I'm having a, a blast with these guys and um, uh, just really happy to be here. And um, like I said, it would take, it would take some crazy, probably unrealistic opportunity to peel me away from this. Right. I, I can appreciate that for sure. Um, you know, one, I guess, being close to home and then. Yeah, yeah, it's totally a different deal. And, and I think what's changed, you know, because no one no one would expect someone to say, I want to race only in the Xfinity series or only in the truck series, whereas a little while ago, whatever, 10, 20, 30 years ago, that was totally normal to do. Yeah. Uh, right. And and. Now I think I think what's changed it is guys coming in with huge funding and ex, you know trying to use it as a ladder system and ultimately really focusing on cup and renting a ride all, every step of the way staying with a team for only one year or two years yep. and then moving on. Whereas I guess in in your stable there a guy like Matt Craft and has done it forever and and that's totally a pretty good template to to try and mold yourself too. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, Duke has been, uh, he's the longest tenured truck team in the series. Um, so he's been around forever. He knows how to do it and do it right and be successful. And, and he's a, a great, a great guy to, to drive for. And, and he's a, a super loyal guy. And, 
Um, and I, and I feel like, you know, I'm, I'm making sure I do the right things to, to be successful and make the most of the opportunity he's giving us and, um, trying to get the most out of, out of what the team is providing us and trying to, um, perfect it each and every week. And, um, it's been a fun ride so far. And, um, you know, like I said, it's, it's great for me being, you know, back, you know, I guess Ohio isn't the Midwest, but it's close. So, um, it just logistically, it makes sense for me. And, um, like I said, the, the thing about with teams in Charlotte, and I, I won't speak for all of them, but maybe the teams that I was with, you know, they, it's a seven to four or five o'clock job, right? When, when business hours were over, there'd be a traffic jam getting out, ready to go home. Here, it's, this is like a, we're a NASCAR team, but it is a short trek mentality. Like all these guys here in the shop, like we have a, a, we have a, I guess maybe a senior group of crew chiefs, but we have a lot of mid to low twenties guys that, that work in the shop, right. That go race their dirt car out here in Ohio on week on off weekends and like there are just we we are just racers up here and it's the people here work here because they want to go racing not because it's a job for them to do and i think that's the huge that's the biggest difference between um our culture here and some of the teams that i've been around in charlotte and that's another reason why um it's just i enjoy getting up and coming to the shop every single day uh just good people with good work ethic and we all have the same goal and we're going to work until the work is done. And, and we'll, we'll be on the pull down till 10 30, 11, 12 o'clock, whatever it takes to make sure we show up to the racetrack with our best chance to win. And that's, and that's something that's, uh, that's, that's easy to rally around when you're here. Right. No, for sure. And that, that must feel good as, as the driver. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> right. Uh, I got to ask you, because you've certainly been around the block uh, with the late model stuff and the super late model stuff, and you've seen your fair share of uh, competitive cars, let's say. And if you listen to Junior's podcast, I steal this question from him for every race car driver. What's the best or top few or most goofy kind of cheating stories or innovation stories that you've got? It doesn't have to be you. It could be someone you know. Yeah, there's, there's been a few of them. Um, I'm with one of the best ones right now, Joe Shear, my crew chief. He's boy, he's, he's been, uh, he's been around the ringer. <laughs> um, no, there's, there's some cool stories. So, um, I'll go with my late model crew chief, Toby Newman. We've been together, like I mentioned before, 11 years now, this is our 11th season together. Um, previously he was actually, um, worked at Menards racing. So, Charlie Menard and Paul Menard used to have late models that they raced up in Wisconsin and unlimited budget, right? Yeah. Um, whatever they needed, they went for it. So, so Toby was given basically just, Hey, make these things as best as you can make them. So he was telling me the story, how he had a, had motorized lead ballast and he took a motor from a windshield wiper and actually had it threaded and basically he can move lead from right to left after tech. So, uh, and he used to show me how he did it, had a little switch and everything. Um, obviously highly illegal and he never got caught, but, uh, yeah, they had some pretty innovative stuff back in, back in the day, uh, when he was racing with Menards, just, uh, with a, with a budget like that, man, you can just, uh, have free reigns to do all that. So you can let the, let the imagination work. Wow. Wow. That's crazy. Little, a little electric motor, eh? Yeah. And you, and you would never, you would never know it. You'd have to basically take the lead out and cut it in half. Like you would, you would never even known it was there. Yeah. Right. Cool. All internal. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty neat. Uh, I see you sometimes outspoken on Twitter and I think it's, I think we're probably cut. Maybe, maybe I'm speaking out of turn, but cut from a similar cloth in that you would rather see a good hard race as opposed to someone just getting dumped in the wall for the win. Yeah, there's been, um, some questionable and I feel like it's, 
it's really going more that direction. I feel like the the more we get drivers in the seats that have never had to experience working on their own equipment, they're they I think they lose maybe respect for who has to build them and work on them and fix them. Um, they know, right, if, if they make a move like that and destroy their car, they just go to bed and come back, you know, and, and hang out with the guys at the shop if that's what they do and head to the next race, and they don't even think anything of it. And I think between that and just – it's just evolved in, in such a way, you know, with, with the way NASCAR's rules are, um, it, it just promotes winning and, and whatever you have to do to do it. And there's not a lot of penalty – for those actions. And I think with the combination of all those things, we've just seen some, some things I wouldn't be comfortable with doing on the racetrack. And, um, you know, I, I play this back in my head, you know, I go back to Phoenix racing for the championship, right? I'm, I'm the lead guy on four tires with under five to go. My teammate, Ben Rhodes, I have a run on him coming down the back stretch, coming into turn three. I have a huge run on him. He threw, throws a big block at me. I have two decisions. I can go and f- toss him into the corner or, or lift. And I think, I think maybe I'm the champion if I don't lift, but I, I could not, I could not risk Ben's my teammate. I could not risk wrecking both of our trucks and ruining the, both of our chances at a championship for Duke. Um, I just, I didn't want to take that risk, even though I might have been able to just move him out of the way and I would have won the championship. And that would have obviously been, you know, what I wanted to happen, but it also could have ended up with us both wrecked. So I decided to lift and um, I think about it a lot and I maybe regret it a little bit, but um, cause you don't, you don't know how many chances you're going to have at racing for a championship, right? I'm in a good spot, good opportunity, but it's hard to make it to Phoenix. Uh, no matter how good you run during the regular season, all it takes is, you know, getting caught up in the big one at Talladega, right? That's in the second round of the playoffs, right? It just takes one little, you know, speeding penalty or mistake on pit road or one bad restart. And that's, you know, no matter how good of a season you can have, you might not make it there. So you always want to take advantage of those opportunities, but I just could not get myself to do that. And, I don't know that it's going to get better. It's probably going to get worse before it gets better. Unfortunately, it's just the world we live in. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I mean, you look at, uh, well, you and I race, you know, little short tracks and, and you look at the clash and in LA and it's like, holy cow, these guys are just wrecking every other lap. Like, how are you? There isn't half the race is under yellow. I know it's just, it's incredible. And, you know, obviously that track promotes that kind of racing. And, um, you know, obviously uh, well, the one instance I'm thinking of is the Xfinity race at Martinsville. Mm. It was just, it was hard for me to watch. I don't know about you, but it, it, I, I cringed when I saw it. I'm like, Oh my gosh. You know, it's just like, I don't know. It's just a lot of respect goes out the window when you see something like that happen, you know, no matter how talented the, the driver is that, that, that does something like that. It's just tough. Uh, you know, I've, I've made some mistakes, but I, I, you know, and I've been aggressive at times. We all have racing for wins. Um, but boy, I don't, I don't know that I could ever get myself to do something intentional like that. That would be, whew, it's tough. It was hard to watch. Yeah, for sure. Uh, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Couple, couple high speed questionable moves last year. Anyways. Um, man, I think, uh, you know, I, I think a lot of times, you know, when people are talking about you, talent, like the word talent comes up, but I, I don't think people realize, you know, how many hours you've put into it, uh, and hard work, whether it be I racing or your late model program, like insane amount of hours, insane amount of races, virtual and real, what advice do do you have for a young guy who's in go-karts or in a late model and wants to make a living as a race car driver? How, however, you know, whatever discipline his, his ultimate goal is, I'm just going to be paid to be a race car driver. What kind of advice or path do you put him on? I think there's a, there's a couple of things that I look back. Um, and may, I would say maybe three things. So 
the first one is, is always surround yourself with good people. No matter what situation you're in, you have to have good people around you. No matter how good of a race car driver you are, you have to have people that are smarter than you around you. Um, like I said, it doesn't matter how talented you are. The people that are building the equipment, whether it's your dad, right? Whether it's, you know, you hire somebody to do it um, or it, whatever the case may be, you have to surround yourself with good people and, and good things will, will typically happen. And, you know, I, I look at the, the race teams that I've been around that have been successful and the race teams that I've been around that haven't. Every time I've been around what I felt a really good race team, we've been successful. And the second one I'll say is I've always lived by this quote. I don't, I'm not sure if somebody came up with it before me, but I'm sure somebody has, but I always, I always live by right when you think you're the best is exactly when you're going to get beat. So I've always lived by that, especially on my late model side, because you know how it is when you hit on something in racing and, and you're maybe ahead of your competition. It's so hard to keep that edge. Mm. And, um, you know, I, I feel like I've been pretty successful on the late model side for a long time. And the way we go about it is we never just settle on something and, and run that package out until it isn't anymore. When we feel like, geez, okay, this team's starting to get a little better. This team's starting to get a little better. We've got, we've got to stay ahead of it. And, you know, so that's kind of a quote that, that I've always, that I've always lived by. And, um, I feel like it's, you know, the mentality, if you can have that mentality and, and, and not, and not get, you know, cocky and, and always think that you can learn something when you go to the racetrack and always think that you can be better, you will continue to be better. And right when, right when you have the mentality that you have it all figured out, that's probably when somebody's going to pass you up. Yeah. For sure. Well, it's it's endless. You know, it's one of those endless sports, just like, you know, the average guy can think about golf like it is. You can be a student of the game forever and then add in the complexity of a dealing with a race car, not just the act of driving it. You know, yeah, Having, no the, doubt. there's a lot of components there. Um, man, I appreciate you coming on. Uh, anything else to uh, tell the folks you're heading into your next full season? Just working in the shop. You out on uh, you snowmobiling at all? Man, you know, it's funny. I used to, I used to be a huge snowmobiler. I still am, but once I I got this, you know, I, once I got to Thor Sport and I got this really good opportunity, I just I've been a little bit gun shy to go snowmobiling because you can't control. I just see horror stories, and so I haven't gone because I really don't want to get myself hurt. Because when I get out on the trail. And snowmobiles handling good. I just can't <laughs> control myself. I have to go. Like I'm out of control. And I, and I do mostly I do mostly trail riding. So we got I got adjustable shocks and I got bump stops on my snowmobile. So we're making adjustments on them, making them handle good. Like that's the fun that we have when we go. Right? It's not looking at the scenery. We're working on our snowmobile like a race car. Right? So, anyways. <laughs> we get out of control. We, we haul ass through the woods and I just didn't want something to happen to where I hindered my opportunity at racing full time the following season. So when I get a little bit older, I simmer down a little bit. I'll get back behind the snowmobile. <laughs> good. No, that's good. That's good. Yeah, man. Uh, I appreciate it. I guess tell people where they can find you. You're kind of an old school guy. You're only on Twitter. Yeah, just Twitter, and I got a Facebook page that I don't run. So uh, <laughs> if you really want to get a hold of me personally, Twitter is the one. <laughs> right on, right on. Well, thanks for coming on, man, and uh, good luck. We're rooting for you. Yeah, man, appreciate it. Good, good talking to you guys. It's been a while. Yeah, take care. If you guys enjoyed this, give me a rating and share it with some friends.